Hello, I'm Professor Afshar at Glendale Community College. This is Physics 103, Lecture 27. In this lecture, we'll discuss the geometric optics of mirrors. This topic is covered in Chapter 36 of our textbook by Surway and Jouette. Before discussing the optics of mirrors, I should first explain a few basic facts about the human vision system, which includes your eyes and the brain and everything in between. It turns out the human vision system does not correct for changes in direction resulting from reflection and refraction. As we've seen, rays or beams of light change their direction of propagation at the boundary between two media. We've seen precise equations like the law of reflection and the law of refraction that tell us exactly how the reflected or the refracted beams will propagate. However, on a very basic primitive level, the human vision system is not at all aware of these changes in the direction of propagation. The human brain basically infers the position of an object by extending backwards the ray that enters the eye. So the human vision system basically sees everything along a direct line of sight. It does not correct for the fact that that ray may have changed its direction of propagation. For example, imagine that you're looking at a pool of water. The sun is high up in the sky and a ray of light emanating from the sun reflects from the swimming pool and ends up in your eye. So now you see a bright object. However, you do not see the bright object high up in the sky. What you see is a bright object actually inside the swimming pool. Your vision system simply extends the ray that entered the eye backwards and assumes that there must be a bright object underneath the water level. Of course, once you recognize that bright object as the sun, then your conscious brain will correct and will suggest that, well, the sun cannot be in the swimming pool, it must be up in the sky, I'm seeing a reflection. However, your first instinct is to see or perceive a bright object under the water. Similarly, if you, the observer, are under the water line and you're looking up at the sky, you don't actually see the sun where it really is. This ray of light that ended up in your eye actually refracted or bent relative to its original direction of propagation in order to end up in your eye. If you're asked to point at where the, uh, the sun is up in the sky, you would simply point along this line here. The ray that ended up in your eye is simply extended backwards and your vision system assumes that the sun must be located here and not here. If you were trying to judge what time of the day it is in the morning, you might think that the, the sun is higher up in the sky. You might think that it's 9 a.m. when in reality it's only 7 a.m. So the vision system is not quite aware of where the real rays are and how they're propagating. The human vision system often takes the ray that enters the eye and simply extends it backwards. What this means is that when we discuss the vision system and the objects and images that we see, we need to talk about two types of rays, virtual rays and real rays. Real rays, as the name suggests, are actual rays of light. Wave energy is propagating along real rays. In this picture, the real rays are solid lines. The virtual rays are drawn as dashed lines in this picture. There is no actual beam of light there. There is no energy propagating along a virtual ray. The virtual ray is what your vision system thinks exists. The virtual ray is an extension of the real ray that enters the eye. In discussions of the optics of mirrors and lenses, this distinction between virtual rays and real rays is going to be important for us. To emphasize the distinction between where objects are actually located and where your vision system sees them, let's do a practice problem. Suppose you've taken up spearfishing as a hobby. 
Should the spear be thrown exactly where you see the fish? If not, how should you adjust your aim? So this is you. You've taken up spear fishing. You've gone to the lake one day. And as you're looking at the lake, you see a fish underwater. The sun is high up in the sky. Rays of light are emanating from the sun in every direction. Some of those rays end up directly in your eyes. Some of the rays reflect from the surface of the lake and then end up in your eyes. And then some of the rays will actually be transmitted into the lake. They will reach the fish. They will reflect off the fish, come back to the surface, refract, and then finally end up in your eyes. That's when you see the fish. So your vision system notices or perceives the fish when this ray of light breaks the surface, refracts, and then eventually ends up in your eyes. Now, the vision system is not aware of this change in direction of propagation. Given theta 1, we can calculate theta 2 using Snell's law, but we don't need to do any calculations for this problem. For this problem, we just want to know roughly how the spear should be thrown. Where you actually see the fish is along the line of sight. Your brain simply extends this real ray backwards, and what we have here, this dashed line, is actually a virtual ray. There is no light energy there, however, you perceive the fish to be somewhere along that line of sight, so where you're going to see the fish is here, not where it actually is. Therefore, if you throw the spear directly along the line of sight, you're going to miss um, the actual fish. Rather than throwing the spear at an angle alpha, you really should be lowering your aim a little bit and throwing the spear at a greater angle beta. In theory, given some coordinates and angles, we could calculate alpha and beta. We'll save calculations like that for a little bit later. The point of this problem simply is that the fish is not located where you see it. In this case, the actual location of the fish is a little bit lower than the line of sight would suggest. Now that we've learned some basic facts about the human vision system, we can start our discussion of mirrors. Mirrors come in all shapes and sizes. There are flat mirrors like the kind you might see in a bathroom. There are concave spherical mirrors, like the ones you might see in makeup mirrors or shaving mirrors. There are convex spherical mirrors, like the ones you might see in parking garages. And there are even parabolic or elliptic mirrors, like the ones you might see in telescopes or automobile headlamps. It turns out, regardless of the shape of the mirror, the optics is dictated by the same basic law, the law of reflection which tells you that the angle of incidence must equal to the angle of reflection. Regardless of the shape and size, this simple equation ultimately determines how mirrors work. What makes the optics of mirrors somewhat complicated is the fact that rays of light must interact with curved surfaces. Also, knowing what one ray is doing is often not enough to understand what we actually see. So this equation must be applied multiple times to multiple rays of light. We will eventually learn how to handle the optics of curved surfaces. For the time being in this class, we want to limit ourselves only to flat and spherical mirrors. So we will not be discussing elliptic or parabolic mirrors, but once you understand how spherical mirrors work, then extending your knowledge to those other shapes will not be too difficult. So for the remainder of this lecture, we want to understand how mirrors form images. In other words, we want to know exactly what we see when we look at an object in a mirror. We'll start with flat mirrors. This blue line here represents a flat vertical mirror. The black line here represents the optical axis. The optical axis is an imaginary straight line that we often draw to guide our thinking in optics problems. The optical axis is a straight line that is perpendicular to the mirror and passes through the center or midpoint of the mirror. 
In front of the mirror, we have an object. This object could be anything you want it to be. This object could be a candle, for example. It could be a flower. It could be a cat. Or it could be a person standing in front of a mirror. We also have an observer or a detector of light. The detector could be literally a person looking at the mirror, but it could also be photographic film or a camera pointed at the mirror. We're also going to assume that the object is somehow illuminated. So there is some source of light, like the sun, the moon, or simply a light bulb that is illuminating the object so that there are rays of light coming in from every direction, striking the object at every point. Furthermore, this incoming light is going to reflect from the object, so we're going to assume that there are rays of light that are emanating from the object, from every point on the object, in every direction. If the object happens to be a candle, then it can generate its own light, but if it's um, something like a flower, then we're going to assume that ambient light is illuminating the flower and that light is reflecting from the flower in every direction. Now, most of this light will simply just end up in space, but some of it will end up in the eye of the observer. When a beam of light travels directly from the object to the eye of the observer, we say that the observer is seeing the object. On the other hand, if a beam of light travels from the object to the mirror, reflects from the mirror, and then ends up in the eye of the observer, we say that the observer is seeing the image of the object. So when you see something in the mirror, so to speak, what you're really seeing is light that originated from the object, reflected from the mirror, and then eventually ended up in your eye. Now, it's a little complicated to talk about all of these rays all at once, so let's do this systematically. Let's talk about a couple of very specific rays. Let's begin with this one. So we have one ray of light emanating from the tip of the object, and it's traveling horizontally parallel to the optical axis. What happens when this beam strikes the mirror? According to the law of reflection, the angle of incidence must equal to the angle of reflection. In this case, the angle of incidence is zero, so the angle of reflection must also be zero. Recall that we measure angles relative to the normal line. So in this case, we're not measuring angles relative to the surface. Instead, we're measuring angles relative to a line that is perpendicular to the surface. If the angle of incidence is zero, the angle of reflection must be zero as well, which means that this beam of light will reflect and essentially go back the way it came in. If this reflected beam of light were to end up in the eye of the observer, the observer would assume that that light is emanating from some point along this straight line here. Now, one ray by itself is not enough to tell us where the image is formed. We need at least two rays. So let's consider another ray. Here is another ray that also starts at the tip of the object, but this time strikes the mirror at its midpoint. Once again, we want the angle of incidence to be equal to the angle of reflection, so this ray will go approximately in this direction. Here, what I'm saying is that this angle here, the angle of incidence, is equal to this angle here, which is the angle of reflection. If this beam of light were to end up in the eye of the observer, the observer would assume that this light is coming from some point along this straight line, along this line of sight. Now, what would happen if both of these rays were to end up in the eye of the observer? Well, the only point in space that is common to both of these lines is this point of intersection. This is the only point that is common to both lines of sight, and therefore the image of the object must form at this point here. So while this arrow represents the object, this arrow represents the image of the object, this is what we would see when we look in the mirror. This object here is referred to, this image here is referred to as a virtual image. 
It's a virtual image because it's, well, not an actual physical object, but more importantly, because it's forming at the intersection of two virtual rays. So there is no actual object behind the mirror. There are no waves or wave energy behind the mirror. These dashed lines represent virtual rays. They are extensions of these real rays in front of the mirror. And because the image is forming at the intersection of virtual rays, we refer to it as a virtual image. So now that we have a rough idea of how a flat mirror forms images, we can start talking about curved mirrors. Specifically, we want to talk about spherical mirrors, and there are two types of spherical mirrors that we need to consider, concave and convex mirrors. Concave mirrors curve away from the observer, while convex mirrors curve toward the observer. On the left, you see a concave mirror. Notice how the center of the mirror is farther from the observer than the edges of the mirror. So we say that the concave mirror is curving away from the observer. On the right, you see a convex mirror. The center of the mirror is closer to the observer than its edges. So we say that the mirror is curving towards the observer. Notice that in drawing these diagrams, by convention, beams of light initially travel from left to right. So in most of the diagrams that I will draw for you, light initially travels from left to right, and then after reflection, it travels from right to left. Certainly, it doesn't have to be that way. You can imagine basically turning either one of these mirrors around. However, as you begin your study of optics, it might be easier if you follow these conventions to avoid some confusion that might arise later. To discuss the optics of spherical mirrors, we must first understand the geometry of the mirror that we're discussing. The mirrors that we're discussing are essentially pieces of spheres. In two-dimensional drawings, we often represent the mirrors as arcs of circles. And of course, whenever you're talking about a circle or a sphere, probably the first thing you want to know is the radius of that circle or that sphere. So whenever we're talking about spherical mirrors, the very first thing we want to discuss is the radius of the mirror. In geometry, the radius of a circle is always a positive number, but in optics, the radius could be positive or negative. The radius for a concave mirror is a positive number. The radius for a convex mirror is a negative number. Here we're using a positive or a negative radius because the curvature relative to the observer is going to be important to us. So a concave mirror might have a radius of plus 3 meters, but a convex mirror would have a radius of minus 3 meters, indicating that the convex mirror is curving toward the observer, not away from the observer. The next important fact that you must know about spherical mirrors is that they have the ability to focus light. So every spherical mirror has a magical point, a very special point, which we refer to as the focal point. Now the focal point is defined in a very specific way. In this picture, we have a spherical mirror. This happens to be a concave spherical mirror. And then we have four laser beams, so four rays of light. All of them are parallel to each other and they are parallel to the optical axis. Remember that the optical axis is basically a line that passes through the center of the mirror and is perpendicular to the mirror at that point. If you want, you can think of the optical axis basically as the x-axis. These four rays are all pa parallel to the optical axis and once they strike the mirror, they reflect in various directions, but you can see in the photograph that there is a single point where they all intersect. The rays are free to move past that point, but there is one single point where they all essentially converge. That special point of the spherical mirror is referred to as its focal point. A little more precisely, the focal point of a mirror happens to be half its radius. This is not a formula that I'm going to prove to you. The proof isn't too difficult. However, it's not very illuminating. Uh, for us, the emphasis is on knowing how to use this formula. 
So given a spherical mirror, the very first thing you want to know about is its radius. That's the distance from the center of the sphere to the mirror itself. And then halfway is the focal point. So at exactly r over 2 is a special point that we'll label as the focal point of that mirror. And that's where reflected beams will intersect. That is not to say that all reflected beams will intersect there, but the ones that are parallel to the optical axis will always reflect from the mirror in such a way that they meet or intersect at the focal point. It turns out the locations of the focal point and the center are going to be key to understanding how spherical mirrors form images. So as I just explained, every spherical mirror is going to have two key points, the center of the mirror and the focal point of the mirror. We now want to know how the mirror forms images. So this blue line here represents a mirror. This happens to be a concave mirror. We'll consider convex mirrors next. The concave mirror has a center point and halfway to the mirror is the focal point. In front of the mirror is an object. You can imagine the object is a candle or a flower or any other object that you care to consider. There's also an observer or some detector of light. Rays of light are going to emanate from the object in every direction. Some of those rays will end up in the eye of the observer. In that case, say, in that case we say the observer is seeing the object, but some of the rays will strike the mirror and reflect from the mirror ending up in the eye of the observer. In that case, we say the observer is seeing the image of the object. Let's consider one of those rays. Suppose one ray of light emanates from the tip of the object and happens to pass through the center of the circle and eventually strikes the mirror. Where does this beam go? Well, notice that the angle of incidence in this case is zero. We know that because to calculate the angle of incidence, we would first draw a tangent to the curved surface. Then we would draw a normal to that surface. Remember that the normal is perpendicular to the surface. Then we would measure the angle of the incoming ray relative to the normal. And in this case, the answer would be zero. So the angle of reflection would have to be zero as well which means that this beam basically reflects back the same way that it came. So a beam that passes through the center will go back through the center. This, of course, is ultimately a result of the fact that the radius of a circle and the tangent to a circle are perpendicular to each other. So if this beam were to end up in the eye of the observer, the observer would assume that that light is coming from somewhere along this line. One ray by itself is not enough. We uh, need at least two rays to tell us where the image is going to form. So let's consider another ray. Here's a second ray that is emanating from the same point on the object, from the tip of the object, but this time it is parallel to the optical axis. So it's a perfectly um, horizontal beam, you could say. We know what happens to such beams, any beam that is parallel to the optical axis will reflect from the mirror and pass through the focal point. Remember, the focal point is where all of those reflections converge. Since this beam here is parallel to the optical axis, it must reflect and pass through the focal point. If this beam were to end up in the eye of the observer, the observer would assume that that light is coming from somewhere along this line. Let's do one more ray. Suppose we have a ray that is again emanating from the tip of the object, but this time this ray happens to pass through the focal point. Well, we know that a ray that is initially parallel to the optical axis will go through the focal point, so it's fair to say that a ray that passes through the focal point must eventually end up being parallel to the optical axis. So we can say this beam is doing the opposite of what this beam was doing. Notice that we now have three reflected rays. If each one were to end up in the eye of the observer, the observer would assume that it's coming from somewhere along the extended ray. 
what point in space is common to all three of those rays if all three rays were to end up in the eye of the observer the observer would assume that they are all emanating from this point here this is the only point that all three uh, lines of sight share so we would say that the image forms here if an observer is looking at the mirror the observer would see an image of the object if this is a candle, then he would see an image of the candle at this location. Notice that in this particular case, the image would be upside down. We'll say more about that a little bit later. We refer to this kind of an image as a real image. We call this a real image because it forms at the intersection of real rays. You can see that the three rays that intersect here are represented by solid lines, not dashed lines. And so the image is a real image. When you see an image using a flat mirror, what you're getting is a virtual image. However, for this type of a surface and this particular object, the image is real. So we saw how a concave mirror forms images. How does a convex mirror form images? We can go through the same exercise. This exercise, by the way, is called ray tracing. So whenever you represent a mirror using a straight or curved line and you imagine an object in front of it and then consider special rays and their reflections, you're basically ray tracing. You're tracing the rays as they emanate from the object and reflect from the mirror. This is an important exercise if you want to understand roughly how mirrors work. I'm going to soon give you equations that makes all of this much more precise, but to conceptually understand how mirrors work, ray tracing is a very useful exercise. This time I have a convex mirror, and a convex mirror also has a center point and a focal point. Remember that the focal point is halfway between the center and the mirror itself. Also notice that for a concave mirror, the center and focal point are on the left, but for a convex mirror, because it curves the other way, the center and the focal point are on the right. By convention, the observer and the object are on the left side, so the rays initially travel from left to right. As usual, there are many rays that are emanating from the object, some will go directly into the eye of the observer, so the observer can see the object directly, but some will reflect from the mirror and then go into the eye of the observer. That's when the observer sees the image. To find out how the image is formed, we want to look at at least two, preferably three rays. Here's one of the rays that's emanating from the tip of the object. This one happens to be aimed right at the center. Recall that the radius of a circle is perpendicular to the tangent of the circle. We can say that this line here is basically the normal line, and therefore the angle of incidence in this case is zero, and according to the law of reflection, the angle of reflection must also be zero. So a beam that starts at the tip of the object and is aimed at the center of the mirror happens to basically go back the way it came. If this beam were to end up in the eye of the observer, the observer would assume that the ray is coming from somewhere along this straight line, from somewhere along the line of sight. Let's consider another ray. This ray is moving parallel to the optical axis. It has to reflect from the mirror. It cannot go through the mirror. Which way will it reflect? It will reflect like so. It will reflect as if it is emanating from the focal point. Notice that the focal point for a convex mirror plays a slightly different role than the focal point for a concave mirror. For a concave mirror, rays that are parallel to the optical axis go directly towards the focal point, but for a convex mirror, those rays go directly away from the focal point. If this particular ray were to end up in the eye of the observer, he would assume that it's coming from somewhere along this line of sight. You can already see an intersection, but just to be sure, let's consider a third ray. This ray is once again emanating from the same point on the object, its tip, 
but this time it's aimed at the focal point. What happens when this ray hits the mirror? Well, it happens to reflect parallel to the optical axis. So if the beam is initially parallel to the optical axis, it will move directly away from the focal point. If it's initially moving towards the focal point, then it will reflect parallel to the optical axis. If these three beams were to end up in the eye of the observer, he would assume that those three beams are emanating from this point here. If you look carefully, you'll see that that's the only point that is common to all three lines of sight. So we would say that an image forms here. Is this a virtual image or is this a real image? Well, as you can see, it forms at the intersection of these virtual rays. Remember that we're using dashed lines to represent virtual rays. And therefore, this is a virtual image. So far, we have seen how flat and spherical mirrors form images of objects that are placed in front of them. Ray tracing provides a crude method for figuring out where the image is relative to the object. Ultimately, though, we need something much more precise. Given the geometry of the mirror and the location of the object, we like to be able to calculate precisely where the image is going to be. The mirror formula does exactly that for us. The mirror formula relates object distance, image distance, and the focal length as follows. Using this equation requires some care because there are some conventions associated with P, Q, and F that you must follow. Firstly, P is the distance from the mirror to the object. So you need to know where the mirror is located, you need to know where the object is located, and you need to measure all distances relative to the mirror. So the mirror becomes the origin or the reference point for all measurements. P is going to be a positive number when the object is in front of the mirror, which is the case in most situations. But occasionally, the object can be placed in the back of the mirror. In that case, P is recorded as a negative number. At this point, it's not obvious when or why the object would be placed in the back of the mirror. This will become more obvious when we consider multi-element optical systems. In systems where there are two or more mirrors or lenses combined, we sometimes find situations where the object is effectively behind the mirror. Q in the formula is the distance from the mirror, but this time to the image. Q can also be positive or negative. When the image is in front of the mirror, Q is recorded as a positive number. When the image is in the back of the mirror, Q is a negative number. When Q is a positive number, we have an image that forms at the intersection of real rays. When Q is negative, we have an image that forms at the intersection of virtual rays. I will not provide a derivation for this equation, as it turns out the derivation is not very illuminating. For us in this course, What's more important is knowing how to use this equation to analyze optical systems. The derivation of this equation, which basically involves a lot of geometry, essentially doesn't teach you anything new about optics. So for us in this course, the emphasis will be on the applications of this equation rather than the derivation of this equation. I should also mention that the mirror formula is typically used to calculate the image distance Q in terms of the object distance P and the focal length F. So although the formula is usually written in this symmetric form on the left, in practice, it's the form on the right that's more useful. In most optics problems, you're given P and F and you're asked for the location of the image. So the form on the left is how you normally see it in your textbook, but the form on the right is typically how you use the formula. The two formulas, of course, are equivalent. If you solve for Q on the left, you get this form on the right. And whichever form you choose to use, you have to remember that there are some conventions associated with P, Q, and F. 
Remember that f is the distance from the mirror to the focal point of that mirror. It is equal to half of the radius of the mirror. Also remember that in this class we'll consider three types of mirrors, flat mirrors, concave mirrors, and convex mirrors, and each one has its own radius. For a flat mirror, you can imagine that the radius is infinity. In other words, you can think of a straight line as being the arc of a circle with a radius that is really, really, really large. In fact, we say that the radius for a flat mirror is infinity, which means the focal length for a flat mirror is infinity. For a concave mirror, we say the radius is positive, so the focal length is going to be positive. But for a convex mirror, we say the radius is negative, so the focal length will be negative. You might be bothered by substituting infinity into an equation. Just remember that 1 over infinity is 0, so an, a focal length of infinity actually simplifies the equations considerably. As we were doing ray tracing, you may have noticed that sometimes the image was inverted and sometimes it was upright. You may have also noticed that sometimes the image was bigger than the object and sometimes it was smaller than the object. Those are also things that we're interested in. In addition to wanting to know where the image is, we also want to know how big the image is and whether it's upright or inverted. To answer those questions, we need to calculate the magnification of the mirror. Magnification is defined as the height of the image divided by height of the object. Consider this scenario. We have an object, for example a tree, and we can say that the height of the tree is h object. This tree is located in front of a mirror, and the mirror creates an image. In this case, the image happens to be inverted. The height of that image is denoted as h sub image. The magnification of this mirror is the ratio of these two heights. We'd like to be able to calculate this ratio given p, q, and f. It turns out this ratio is equal to minus q over p. So given the object location and the image location, we can calculate the magnification using this formula. Of course, Q can itself be expressed in terms of P and F using the mirror formula. So magnification can also be written as minus F divided by P minus F. It's the magnification that tells us whether the object is bigger or smaller than its image. It's also the thing that tells us whether the image is inverted or upright. Turns out, once you calculate the magnification, if it is between 1 and infinity, then we have an image that is bigger and it is upright. So a positive magnification indicates an upright image. If it's between 0 and 1, it's still a positive number, so it's upright, but now it's smaller than the object. If the magnification is negative, then we have an inverted image. For 0 to minus 1, we have an image that is smaller than the object and inverted. And from minus 1 to minus infinity, we have an image that is bigger, but it is upside down or inverted. Again, I haven't derived this formula for you, but the derivation is simply not very illuminating. The emphasis for us is on the use of this formula to better understand the human eye, cameras, telescopes, and other optical systems. This slide summarizes some of the more interesting properties of spherical mirrors. Recall that there are two kinds of spherical mirrors, concave and convex. In these pictures at the bottom, the two mirrors on the left are concave mirrors, and the one on the right is a convex mirror. The ray tracing for each one of these pictures is shown above it. As you can see, for a concave mirror, you can have an inverted image or an upright image. Which one you get depends on how far the object is relative to the mirror itself. Also notice that for a concave mirror, you can have a real image or a virtual image. The real image is going to be upside down, as you can see in this picture here. 
the virtual image is going to be right side up and bigger, as you can see in this middle picture. Convex mirrors are a little bit simpler. Convex mirrors always create virtual images. And as you can see, the virtual image is smaller than the object. The exact size of the virtual image depends on how close or how far the object is relative to the mir mirror. You can calculate the size by figuring out the magnification for that mirror. And that is the end of this lecture. Thank you for your attention.